So this is uh, my great pleasure to introduce Sabina Leonelli. Um, Sabina is half Italian, half Greek, but there are also other halves, I think. <laughs> so she's a, a, a very uh, diverse person from, her, uh, from the point of view of her origin. Also, as you will see in a minute, she has very diverse and very uh, broad interest in many different areas and with many different approaches. So uh, Sabina is a professor at the Uni University of Exeter and a member of Agenis. Uh, I just learned that Agenis is much bigger than I thought. That was I thought it was big, but it's very big, 35 uh, faculty members. And uh, Agenis is a very good center for philosophy of biology, also uh, sociology of science, anthropology of science, in fact, very diverse methods and very diverse objects, also for medicine and other different topics. And uh, Sabina is a uh, co-director of uh, Agenis uh, at the moment, together with uh, John Dupre. Um, she's also a Turing Fellow at the Alan Turing Institute in London. Um, she also, um, so she uh, leads the data studies research strand at, the, at uh, Agenis. She became recently the editor-in-chief of one of our main uh, journals in uh, philosophy of biology and in history of biology, which is called History and Philosophy of the Life Sciences, a very interesting journal with deep roots in history, Naples, and you know, interesting, interesting history, and a very interesting journal. And she does that with uh, Giovanni Bognolo, uh, uh, obviously a philosopher of medicine in Italy. And she's also associate editor for the Harvard Data Science Review. Um, she published uh, three years ago um, a book called Data-Centric Biology at the uh, University of Chicago Press. And this book was uh, uh, awarded the uh, Lakatosh Award uh, in, well, last year, in fact, in 2010. 18. Um, and I think it was you know, really an important recognition for all the work of Sabina, uh, which resulted in fact in this book. So this book, as she says somewhere in the, somewhere in the book, it's, it's the product of uh, something like 12 years of work on data in very different uh, domains. And again, what, what I think is extremely uh, striking with uh, Sabina's work is that she uses methods from philosophy of science, anthropology of science, sociology of science, etc., etc., and she applies that to different domains. So, including, for example, something which is not very usual among philosophers of biology, which is that Sabina has worked on plant science, and of course, plants are very important, but philosophers have tended to neglect a little bit plants, and Sabina has worked on plants, but also on all sorts of other domains, including recently oncology. So that's like new stuff, and uh, very nicely Sabina suggested to present here in this uh, medically oriented environment uh, that work. So Sabina, thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Your talk will be talk will, will be about actionable data for precision oncology, building trustworthy evidence for exploratory research and clinical diagnostics. So thank you again, Sabina. Thank you, Philip. So it's a really ugly pleasure to be here. I think it was, for me, overdue. It's, it's a place that in many ways is our intellectual twin. Like, so I'm really, really delighted to be here and thank you very much for the hospitality. So what I'm going to do in this talk, I mean, this looks like it's going to be pretty applied. I will try to give a philosophical framing to um, the world that I'm talking about, but we are actually still at a moment where we are dealing with a lot of empirical material we collected by working very closely with clinicians, people from industry, and as you'll see, data curators in the ecological space. And so, you know, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to feedback also in terms of helping us to push this work further in intellectually and philosophically. So, and I should say, um, this is joint work with Nicola Tempini, who is one of my colleagues at the Igeni Center. He's done many of the interviews and empirical work that underpins uh, the ecological analysis here. So, um, now, what I'm going to do today, I'm going to do something of this kind, let's hope that I don't run out of time completely. So, I want to, first of all, frame a little bit the kind of work that I'm doing, and other people are doing, on data-intensive work within the sciences, and think a little bit about what problems this poses in thinking about data per se <coughs> as an object. And then I want to focus a little bit more on the problem actually, you know, what we call in translational inference in medicine which we think is a particular kind of inference in the sense that even more than any other kinds of inferences in science, it brings in very strongly all values and processes and infrastructures 
in enabling inferences and in fact in basically shaping what the um, result of that inference will be. And then I want, I'm going to spend most of my time on the case of counter economics and particularly on one data infrastructure called Cosmic, which focuses its main data infrastructure for somatic mutations in cancer and is a very, very peculiar infrastructure and the ways I will describe. And so for us, it was a very, very good place to start our investigation. And then I want to frame all of this through the issue of data actionability. I will come to this um, soon. And we'll try then to get back to issues around trust risk in big data medicine, if you want, and the role of theory in this kinds of, um, this kinds of things. So starting from what philosophers have been thinking about data for a while, and um, one of the problems, I think, in, in philosophy of science when approaching particularly the applied sciences has been the fact that many of the people who've done wonderful work, for instance, statistical inference and in models of reasoning, have focused very much on the formal, the logical parts of thinking with evidence and with data. And, you know, and that's mostly because people have thought, well, I mean, ultimately, of course, theories and models are essential in making any sense of the data. But from that, they've drawn, I think, what is the wrong inference for me, which is, therefore, we're not going to be interested in data at all. We're never going to even consider that. All we're going to talk about is theories and models, and data will sort of come along for the ride as the, you know, the empirical input. So the people talk about empirical inputs, and then they start discussing very deeply theories and data. And that's something that Patrick Soupis, who's a very well-known philosopher of science, working in this area, had already lamented, in a sense. But in fact, he himself got so scared by the intricacies of dealing with the messiness of experimental practices that his conclusion was, well, you know what? Actually, philosophy starts with statistics. Because before that, before you apply statistics, before you think of inference statistically, I'm not quite sure what philosophers can do. And the, the result of this is basically that there's, there's very little work, there's been very little work looking at data practices to some extent at least independently from modeling. And another very important philosopher in this space, Jim Woodward, lamented that in fact we are now in philosophy seeing the evidential relationship as a purely formal, logical, or a priori matter. And part of this issue also I think relates with you know, the fact that philosophers, when they talk about data, sort of get stuck on the question of theory relatedness, the fact that, of course, we all well know from the history of science, there's no data production without some sort of theoretical input. So, of course, all data are theory related to some extent, they're related to expectations that accompany the creation of the data. And, of course, that has always been a very big issue for philosophers to deal with, because on one hand, they want to be able to say, well, for empirical sciences, there is a difference to empirical science and theoretical science. That difference is partly due to the fact that you're using data that you collect through interactions with the world. So this data, I mean, there's something given to this data. There's something that you can't completely control from a theoretical perspective. And yet, we know that data are totally made up in some other ways. You know, they're, they're the result of very often very intricate experimental setups, very sophisticated instruments. So how can we think about those things that are given? And I think we are in a situation where philosophers have been stuck with this problem for a very long time, and it's become almost embarrassing. Uh, and I think, personally, I think that's one of the reasons why people avoided talking about data for quite a long time. Because it was, you know, it was the kind of thing where they well, if you go too deeply into that, it starts to look like a sort of, you know, STS, sociology of science argument which deconstructs science completely, which especially now with all the post-truth disaster we don't want. And so that created a problem. Now, I think what this situation created is a very particular conceptualization of data, which I call it the representational view of data. This is the idea that data are, if you want, a representation of the world, a mirror image. They capture something about the natural world, and that something is not controlled or even shaped by humans, and that something is what creates, if you want, the empirical ingredient for our theorization. And what exactly they document about the empirical work is what we want to uncover, right? And so you conceptualize the scientific methods or a pseudo scientific methods as tools to uncover the truth, if you want, from the data and about what the data actually tells about the world. And so this is just a figure to summarize this idea. You have you know, a situation where you're dealing with the world, you're documenting the world via data that represent the world, and from data you infer knowledge, and that knowledge, of course, is then based on data. Now, this sounds very plausible, and it is, you know, and it's a perfectly legitimate way of thinking about data. That's not how I think about it. So um, I think a big challenge to this way of conceptualizing data comes from 
all the different manifestations of what I call in data centrism, but essentially what I mean is all the different branches of science which come to more and more rely on data analysis, particularly at the point when big data are becoming the keyword that we're all thinking about, and so there is this idea that more than at any other point in the history of science, we are relying on, to some extent, partly automated methods to extract knowledge from a widening platform of data. So, you know, they, I think some of the characteristics of open science and big data today, for instance, are the fact that, yes, there is a huge expansion of the scope in the scale of data dissemination, the reuse of data, data that come maybe from completely different fields sometimes, or in different locations, is ubiquitous. Happens very, very often. That is something that actually I think is very difficult to explain within the representation of view, because within that view, the idea that data has a certain evidential value is sort of fixed. You know, you, you sort of, you know, you get it once and, and, and now you know what data is about. This constant reuse where you can use different data sets to actually um, fulfill different purposes for different goals, that's something that actually I find very difficult to reconcile with this more representation of the person. There's of course a lot of work on the limits and the failures of automation, also a strange phenomenon. Because if you have, you know, if you if you in a situation where you have a representation of your data, well you would think that you just need to get your methods right and you will have a perfect way to always get at the truth as long as you can repeat that inferential mechanism. And yet that doesn't seem to be working particularly well either, or at least it works in very, very particular cases. And of course there's a constant emphasis more and more on data as a scientific object component in and of itself, an output if you want which actually has value even independently from the claims that you may actually extract from the data. So I think from at least the observation of this kind of phenomena, I picked up quite a lot of philosophical, I think, of philosophical questions. One would be how actually, how can we conceptualize data changing meaning, in fact, the information content? How do you understand inference and discovery when data tend to move between different contexts? and what forms of reason are involved in this. What counts as good data here? What kind of um, criteria do we use to decide that? What do we mean by raw data? Is there such a thing? And how do we distinguish that from other forms of, 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 of data? How do data relate to model? And, um, and how do you understand inference from data the to interventions? And that's actually what I want to talk about today. So I've done quite a lot of work on all of these questions. And um, one of the ways in which I pursued this uh, together with a few people who have me in this project is through a project called the Epistemology of Intensive Science, which is now almost getting to a close this year, which was funded by the European Research Council. And the key uh, methodological principle, intellectual principle behind that project was to actually really try and understand how data move between different contexts. And specifically, we, were, we, we have been interested in movement from sites of production of the data to sites in which they get disseminated in a variety of different ways, to sites in which they can then get interpreted and reinterpreted and reinterpreted. And in doing this work, and so we call these data journeys. In doing this work, we focus particularly on databases as a starting point. So we thought that actually looking at the dissemination of data provides a very interesting window to see, first of all, the conditions under which data actually can be made to travel, but also to track the data journeys in the first place, because actually that's a very difficult thing to do because data are not usually tagged, and they're not credited in the same way as a paper would be. So in fact, to follow the data has been a very, very difficult methodologically thing to do, which is why methodologically we use a lot of qualitative methods. We use historical methods, sociological, anthropological, ethnographies, all these kinds of things to try and literally follow this. And of course, we looked at databases and data dissemination, but also we looked at a lot of different cases of data reuse. In fact, to verify what happens when, when data are reused in different circumstances, to which extent this, with, that this happen, what characteristics that the kind of reuse have. So let me say something about the nothing more. No. I think I'll come back to this if you are interested. <coughs> yeah. uh, okay, so the kind of landscape that we ended up in, in struggling with, that's the figure that's missing from the book because they really, the, yeah, no, they got it wrong. Um, it's, it's something like this, where you yeah, have Lots of different, if you want, silos or different production contexts for data. Some of them produce all sorts of different kinds of data, from image data to numerical data to symbolic, all sorts. Others where are very, which are very uniform, maybe it's only just texts, you know, like a historical archive, for instance, or, or a document archive or any sort. And from all of these different data sources, they tend to be picked up by different types of databases. 
which all intersect in very different ways, which are very often serendipitous, they're not coordinated in any way because databases are funded in other you know, uh, kind of eclectic ways, let's put it this way. And so when you start to look at this very intricate ecosystem of data infrastructures, the first thing you note is that cases of data reuse, generally speaking, tend to pick from very different parts of this landscape. Very often, that certainly was the case also when we're looking at medicine and oncology. So you get situations where the same type of data was maybe from this and there, right? But in fact, there is no direct relationship between this part of the data infrastructure's ecosystem and this part. And that's one of the things that for us was very interesting because it really provokes this expectation that I think many scientists as well as philosophers have that when you're using data, you have sort of complete understanding and control over the conditions to which they have been produced and also how they've been processed. This is clearly a situation, I think, if there is one thing that characterizes the sort of big data era, is the fact that we don't have any of that awareness anymore. It's too distributed. So there's just too many people involved in this kind of landscape. And that's, I think, what generates some of the interesting philosophical questions, but also the very interesting scientific questions about how on earth do we check for quality in a situation like this, which is actually the heart of what I'm going to be talking about today. So very briefly, um, in terms of philosophical approach to data, from this kind of studies, I've been pushing a different idea about data, which I call relational, according to which what counts, I mean, and this is based on the observation that in fact, in this kind of landscape, what counts as data keeps changing. So within the same data journey, you can see a certain kind of data set traveling around and people picking different sides to it, assigning different meanings to it, in kind of assembly with other data sets, decomposing it to go and assemble with other data sets again, dropping it, forgetting about it, resurrecting it later on, etc., etc. So there's a constant shift in what people actually think are the data in the situation. And so for me, that was a, a, something that really made me think we need to give up the idea, which is core to the representational view of data, that data are defined by the degree to which they're manipulated and then defined by their intrinsic property. There's something about a photograph that tells you exactly what the photograph is about, right? Because, I mean, even in the case of a photograph, actually you can, you, know, you can look at it in many different ways and analyze it in different ways. And so this basic framework sees data as any product of research activities that actually is collected, stored, and disseminated in order to be used as evidence for knowledge claims. And the more general definition, any object can be considered as a datum as long as it is treated as potential evidence for one or more claims about phenomena and it is possible to circulate it among individuals and groups. This is a very broad definition, but actually it turns out to be quite restrictive when you start to look at uh, scientific work. And we'll get into some of the implications of this, um, of this as we go along. So this is of course a relational framework, a situation where data are defined in terms of their function within a particular situation of inquiry. They're not predefined by having a certain uh, physical characteristic. Of course, that also means that the same object may or may not be functioning as data depending on that situation. And so the same object may have very different histories as they travel around. So if you have this view of data, how do you think about inference? Well, inference is first of all, as a broad generalization, not the product of particular statistical methods that may come later, but in fact, is a process of situating data within a particular context in, in relation to elements of, uh, elements of elements to interpretation, which may vary quite substantially depending on the situation you're in. The key materials, instruments, interests, norms, and of course, research goals also like, um, plays a very important role here. And we have a whole story about what to think about particular alignments and the stability of alignments between certain commitments, goals, and instruments we use for investigation, in which I've done with Rachel Ackney, we call them repertoires, but I'm not going to get to this. So the crucial thing in terms of um, understanding how we're coming to the problem of um, the use of genetic data in oncology is to think that the procedures through which data are processed and ordered are the, the ones that are really crucial to the interpretation. And not in the sense that they're uncovering the truth about the data, but they're actually helping you to determine, in fact, co-determine like, um, a way in which you can interpret the data credit. So a way to summarize this is to think about the production of knowledge slightly differently from the representation of you. So you can think about you know, any research um, enterprise is constituted by some interactions with the world. Those interactions produce certain objects which are then processed as data 
they may not be closest to data, but in some, in some cases they are, and that requires a lot of work, which I spent a lot of my work documenting. These data then get ordered, so we somehow, in different ways, as models, and the questions of representation really happen here. It's when you order the data and situate it in particular ways that you actually assign a fixed representational context to the data. It doesn't happen here. Of course, there's a lot, a long story to be had, we can have a discussion about the ways in which the physical properties of the data actually really do matter in what you can and cannot do in terms of modeling them and, and, and the representational value you can give to them. But the important thing for the rest of the story is to remember this. Representational value comes here. It is not something that's intrinsic to the data, in my understanding of the data knowledge. And then, of course, it's the models that are interpreted as knowledge, which then feeds back into interactions with the world, etc., etc., etc. Now, another of the things that is very, I care uh, about quite a bit, is the idea that, you know, in, in many ways, I think you can make this argument, and that's going to actually be in the main argument in my next book, if that ever appears. Um, in many ways, philosophy of science has been theory centric, like very obsessed with theory as the beginning and the end, if you want, the main output of scientific investigation. And I think one of the things that my work is doing, and I think in that sense I share very much with Nancy Cartwright, we discussed it recently, and we both like to think about it in these terms, is repositioning theory, not as the center of inquiry, and so to the, this pivotal point, but as something that happens in very different forms at every single stage of inquiry. And of course, what, I, what I'm very concerned with, and you see it now in the case of oncology, is the ways in which the production of objects, but even more, the transformation in data and the modeling, actually involves a lot of theoretical steps and commitments, which are not necessarily the same as you would find in other parts of this cycle. One of the things that interests me quite a bit, particularly in relation to this uh, paper, but I haven't gotten as far as really thinking through, um, is how, you know, does that, this kind of framework and this kind of illustration with all these limitations, which are always the case with diagrams, does that actually work for intervention? And that's very important to me because if there is one thing that I've really done very consistently since I was a PhD student is worry a lot about embodied knowledge. So in my work, I mean, it's absolutely you know, essential that the word knowledge is not interpreted as a propositional knowledge only. So for me, like basically activities and knowledge in the form of, 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 of agency is also very, very important in the conception of knowledge. So that's the way I want to read that graph. And I'm still wondering whether it actually works, you know? Like that's, that's one of the things that for me, this case of thinking about the clinical use of evidence really challenges me to do. And of course, I've, I've written about this also in, in agricultural perspective, but, but this is nice. So the big question, I think, at the back of this paper is, how do we go from data to knowledge as intervention in the case of trying to use big data to, um, uh, if you want, to choose um, diagnostics and to, in fact, cure cancer. And of course, in, that's one of the things that every philosopher, I guess, would agree on. This is a movement from data to intervention, which is profoundly underdetermined by empirical evidence. And that's the constant issue, like how do we fill all those gaps that we have here? We don't have a straightforward story or a straightforward causal narrative that we're following. So what is going on in this realm? Now, what we want to do in this paper and this work is to reframe this issue slightly. And reframe it not so much in terms of thinking about inferential reasoning per se, but really thinking in terms of data practices and seeing what happens if you turn this story around, you turn this question around, and you consider it from the point of view of data. What does it mean to be data actionable? And how do you think about actionability through these data journeys as a motivation for people who actually set it up? So we've done actually quite a lot of field work on biomedical um, cases. And of course, that seems very Obviously, and so we, we looked at a few different cases that we took to be emblematic of different aspects of these kinds of medical intervention. So Nicolò in particular done a lot of work on patients like me and sites like that, which actually are trying to crowdsource information that could then be used for medical purposes. It's fascinating work and I strongly recommend this work on this if you're interested in this topic. And we also done work together on the SAIL database and now in the steering committee, so I hear a lot, a lot about it. And we admire this database a lot because this really, we think, is one of the best places to really think about anonymization and securitization of medical data in Europe. It's based in Wales. They have 15 years of experience in doing that. Interesting thing about that case is that in 
thinking about security issues, they've actually become experts within it themselves. So they're actually the ones who are creating the knowledge or who constructed it very often. So we have um, um, quite a bit of work on this. We looked at uh, situations where you're trying to integrate very big medical data sets, highly heterogeneous, with even more <laughs> heterogeneous and large data sets from environmental sciences, the so-called data mashups. So that's really thinking about you know, what used to be called at least epidemiology, like looking towards public health, and a little bit of work on this. And the paper today is looking at yet another very different um, manifestation, which is a database that, in a sense, grows out of a tradition I've done a lot of work with historically, which is a tradition of thinking about mostly genomic data on model organisms, mostly places like the European Bioinformatics Center. And, um, and then moving that way of thinking about how do you curate, how do you assemble data into the human realm and specifically in oncology. So this is the case of COSMIC, which is the catalog of somatic mutations in cancer and is basically one of the most important reference points for that uh, within uh, contemporary oncology. So, I mean, of course, the issue raised here uh, from considering the issue, the, the, the case of uh, COSMIC is how do you analyze genomic sequences generated from cancerous tissue? Yeah, lots of situations where you have these kinds of samples, you analyze them, you sequence them, and then what happens? Right? And that's where we, that the, the work of Cosmic is really focused. And particularly also there is this constant question of not only how do you do this, but how do you do it on a routine basis? How do you do it on a basis which really will be part of you know, so-called personalized medicine or precision medicine in the clinic on an everyday basis? So not as a big research, kind of actually as something you can do. So, Within Cosmic, the idea is that you try and research evidence and associations between mutated genes and particular cancer types, susceptibility um, of these types to targeted treatments, and many other functional implications. Now, the Cosmic database um, originated in 2004. It originated as a relatively, you know, as a simpler exercise of just trying to catalog genes that were observed in the future to have some relation to some types of cancer. But of course, Many phenomena and many discoveries happen in between, many of which you guys have written about you know, a lot and you know much more about than me. And of course, the main one is the problem of heterogeneity and the ways in which um, actually genes turn out to be expressed in cancer cells, which is incredibly varied and very, very difficult to pinpoint and becomes then a highly personalized kind of analysis. So, in synchrony with how the field has developed in a way, COSMIC also developed as a set of, as a, as a, as a data set started in this particular way, but it started to diversify and try and become more and more sophisticated in the ways in which we were trying to capture questions around gene expression in relation to particular types of cancers like, and, and covering a lot of ground in that way. So um, now, this is really the leading database for this, for the functional interpretation of genetic and genomic data in oncology. Of course, it aims to improve the circulation of available research data. It was born for research uses, but as I will uh, discuss in a moment, it actually is increasingly used in diagnostics and in the pharmaceutical sector. And that's something that interests us a lot. And we actually interviewed many of our interviewees for this case, and people that come from industry. And particularly sometimes startup companies who are trying to use some of this information to generate different types of diagnostics. So, just to kind of have a little look around um, the, the database. So, right now they have. Um, about, yeah, well, I mean, this was um, 2018, I think, is the last, um, the last version that came out, is at the end of last year. At that point, they had 20,366 cancer genomes with annotated mutations. But actually, the interesting thing about COSMIC is that there are two different ways of approaching curation. One is by basically doing big genome browsing um, analysis. So basically, you know, pulling in using algorithms, lots of different information, and from the existing databases, which are many, 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 as many of you I'm sure know, in this area, that could associate the genes <coughs> to uh, particular cancers or particular, uh, uh, particular phenotypes. But then they have a kind of in-depth curate, curation, which in fact absorbs a lot of their, um, their efforts, which is really manually curating 200 of those genes, so as to can really uh, provide a comprehensive, as, as comprehensive as possible, an analysis and a visualization of all the different information available around those genes in the literature, and also try and keep that updated, which of course is a very, very uh, labor-intensive uh, type of work. 
Um, of course, uh, this information gets visualized in all sorts of different ways, and in fact, I'm not going to get too much into this at this point, but you can sort of imagine what it would be like, and in fact, you can go and, and look at it online if you want, while I'm talking. Um, I'm going to give you an example concretely soon. And the idea here is that there's a very particular pipeline of the integration of data in mind while doing this. So the idea is actually you go from you know, sequencing data, you go through some sort of bioinformatics pipeline, where you start to identify some variants and compare with normal samples, then you get, you basically identify your tumor specific variants, and at that point you start to filter and annotate these variants and, and produce some kind of characterization, and then you come up with some reportable variants, which are actually the ones that you're going to be using as actionable, if you want, and then um, you go through a, a process of clinical interpretation and reporting pipeline. The interesting thing here, as you can see, is that the ways in which all of these steps, all of these filters are, 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 are put together is actually very labor intensive. A lot of it is manually done, a lot of it is decisions taken by people involved at some point of this pipeline in actually assessing what's going on in the evidence here. And, um, and similarly, this is just to give you at least some sense of the fact that there are really a very, very, very many data infrastructures that intersect with COSMIC in trying to do this kind of very big work of evidence integration and, 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 and categorization. And so there's, there's you know, complex processes in trying to do this. And, I mean, and that actually makes the status of COSMIC even more interesting. Because in fact, I mean, compared to some of these other databases, a very small enterprise with a relatively small group at the EBI, and yet is really seen to be the most reputable in the field. And that's partly what we're trying to I mean, we'll like, and, and that's partly one of the reasons that we motivated the choice of the case and, and the way which we learned. So, I mean, just, of course, it, there's new versions coming out every six months to a year, in keeping with the idea that this information needs to be annotated very quickly and updated regularly because of the way the, the velocity in which the field is, um, is developing. Now, how to think about actionability in this kind of context of precision medicine? Well, I mean, generally speaking, there are many ways in which you can think of precision medicine. I guess one general one is to think about the fact that the intent there is to leverage this new technology to achieve unprecedented levels of granularity of the description and action of disease and therefore like, you know, support targeted therapy. And this, you know, I mean, there's a lot of work on this and a lot of discussions of this, but in fact, this is made enormously difficult by the amount and the heterogeneity of the data that you need to then go through to be able to actually get this kind of result. And so the big problem we think in, in this type of translational research is translating this kind of granular description into granular action. Where do you look for evidence? How do you identify what entity should be targeted? And how do you do that? And that's exactly what COSMIC is really supposed to do. So uh, one way in which people have been thinking about actionability particularly within cancer genomics, which I would recommend you read if you're interested in this topic, is um, sociologists Alberto Cambrosio, Peter Keating, and Nicole Nelson, um, who have been uh, have written about actionability as a performative classifier that assigns certain other entities to distinctive categories that have implications for clinical actions. And what they remark here, of course, that's coming more from the sociological viewpoint, is that making a particular genetic mutation actionable depends not only on the relationship between a patient's mutation status and predictive drug effect, it also depends on other factors such as the regulatory status of the mutations and drugs, the availability of testing and treatments within healthcare systems, and the geographical location and design of clinical trials for drugs still under development. Now, we are interested in picking up on this idea, which we think is very valid, but then seeing what it means when you apply it specifically to think about data practices in this way. So the question here is really about the actionability of evidence in COSMIC and to which extent uh, this actually can be or is regarded to be trustworthy and under which conditions. So some of the things that COSMIC um, uh, uh, staff says, we want to focus on supporting precision oncology as much as possible because while a number of mutations causing cancer are understood, quite a large number are considered potentially causing cancer but no one quite knows how or why. So this idea that actually we know very, very little about causal pathways in any genetic sense in cancer is absolutely at the core of cosmic. So we're not looking at a straightforward case of what are these people doing, are they all completely ignoring like all the theoretical what has happened in cancer the, over the last 20 years. No, I mean, this is at the heart of some of the things they're doing. At the same time, there is this imperative to provide something that can be used in the clinic. 
And of course, using biomarkers which relate to particular uh, genetic signatures is a very useful thing to try and still and explore. And so the idea is to try and think about the certification of epistemic judgment to involve the routine steps in cancer genomics by zooming into data practices. So one of the things that, of course, we've been um, immediately asking people who use Cosmic is why do they trust this database, given the complexity of what these people are trying to do, the diversity of theories around cancer and its causal structures. And in, I, many of them basically really do that they trust it quite a bit. One person, for instance, says the first question when you find mutation generally are those previously reporting mutations, are they active in materials? This is where cosmic comes into play. It tells us whether others have found it before. Or in another case, well, I mean, maybe if there are consistent <coughs> mutations, there must be in the cosmic database. We go back into the cosmic database to check how much already is known and which are normal mutations and which are not there. So <coughs> there's a sense in which cosmic really is, is now working as a bottom line, you know, this is where I go if I want to check evidence for particular mutations. If there's some kind of disagreements between databases, you may not go with that kind of gene. Maybe we don't trust even databases, so we try to deprioritize that. So there's a lot of contextualization around it here, but there's still the idea that you can go through databases and they really do give you a very important element in, in, in thinking about your evidence. So how does that really work? Well, the interesting thing about um, Cosmic is choosing to leverage big data if you want less than you would expect and really focus on a core set of targets, full standardized practice and routinization of the updates, where the curators actually specialize. And in fact, each curator in Cosmic is specialized in a particular set of genes, their own genes, as they call them, which they follow through the literature and basically they become you know, lifelong companions with this, they keep trying to understand and see like, what, what is going on there. So they call this kind of in-depth genetic curation versus broad panel curation. Um, one of the things that happens, and we, 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 we picked uh, this term from uh, Matt Fortune, into the 2008 book on, on promises in, in genomics, and, and we, see, we see happening at all points in this curator, curator trajectory, is you know, if you want essentially people placing bets, making what uh, Fortune calls forward-looking judgments on actually what the epistemic status of particular information may be and how we may want to interpret that. And so an obvious, obvious example is the decision of whether to classify a certain mutation as a passenger or a driver mutation. So <coughs> something that actually is causally implicated into causing a particular um, trait or whether it's sort of going along, it can act as a signal, but it's not thought to be directly causally implicated. And that's something that, you know, in some cases, people can base themselves on evidence in the literature, but in fact, very often also happens based on a judgment that the curators here are taking in, in classifying this. And of course, this reflects a lot of work in philosophy on, on the importance of heuristics in constructing um, not just theories, but in this case, also evidential platforms um, for thinking about phenomena. And Bill um, Bertal is a very nice paper that develops some um, of these ideas. And, but also this arch is back to work, work, by, uh, work by him and Alan Richardson, and work by Bill Bertel, and Craven and Darden, etc., etc. So it's something that we find over and over again. Now, one of the things that for us became very interesting is to see that the notion of actionability in this realm tends to vary depending on the kind of user and how they interpret, in fact, um, what they're doing. And we saw quite a clear difference between people who are using Cosmic within, if you want, generally, you know, exploratory biomedical research, where they're really trying, in fact, to understand ultimately causal mechanisms and they're interested in the causal link between observable biological features and cancer behavioral events, which may well include diagnostics. And, in, and the behavior of people who are thinking about actionability of data in the diagnostic space, in more, uh, more specifically. So we get to this in a minute. And one of the interesting things about um, thinking of actionability in this exploratory research space is that ultimately this means thinking about, you know, if you want the uh, gene form pathways and how can we manipulate that to change the cancer like that our patient has. And in relation to this kind of research, um, Cosmic has actually developed more and more ways to try and visualize the information they have 
so that even if there's no definite uh, causal understanding, it's at least suggestive of something that can be transformed into such. And I think one of the interesting ones is, is to think about this cosmic 3D, a tool that they developed recently, which is trying to visualize and understand the structural specificities of mutated gene products that may offer the opportunity for targeted intervention. So, just to give you an example of this, sorry, don't get out of this, just a second. And, okay, so, it's just an example to, to give you a sense of what it means to use cosmic. I mean, this is just looking at the, um, at the cross and gene and how it's been annotated. This is one of the ones that has been annotated in depth. And then you see a wealth of information about the gene here, including an overview, like very. We, we, we don't see it. We don't see it. Oh! It's fine. What is that? We see something. Extended test. So if you think about that, 
then I think there is a suggestion here that the way in which cosmic is structured and the ways in which it brings you through the imaginary of action ability really is quite dependent on this oncogenetic understanding of cancer, despite the fact that they provide all sorts of information that you potentially could use for the, in the context of other ways of theorizing cancer. And of course, a, a typical example of using action ability in this way is um, new techniques of diagnosis, like new techniques for biopsies, like the new biopsy in this case. This is obviously a case where you just want to be able to go in on the basis of a lot of data that you can um, access then easily at different stages of the disease uh, to actually have, um, have this kind of predictive associations. And at the same time, um, you lose in terms of potentially thinking about um, in causal mechanisms and the nature of the, or the histotype you're dealing with and, and the nature of the, of the tissue that you're analyzing. Now, there's a lot of course of curatorial worries here in this class we're very, very interesting to pick up. So curators are very, very worried about what's going on in this um, trying to synthesize and also to interpret to some extent what is going on in the general field of, of thinking about somatic mutation in cancer. And, and this you know, is, is typically thought of as an initial quality control. People are worried about what may be left out to the database, neglected discoveries, and also what they put in, potential errors, for positives, and this kind of validation. And this is um, a curator uh, talking about this and saying, I, get really, I really get worried about making mistakes. If you're going to be a good curator, and I think that does apply to other people in the office too, but you've got to have a certain level of worry or fear almost of making a mistake. I really check everything, I probably spend a bit too long checking things because then you don't get quite as much done. But on the other end, you know we get people to use the database and, and send their tickets to complain about something being wrong. And whenever you see it, and it's one of my genes, right, I go kind of puke and I really get panicky and I really hope it's not my fault. Right? So there is a very strong understanding among these curators that actually whatever information they end up Whatever way they end up framing the information, if you want, and processing it and visualizing it within database, may well be interpreted uh, by people, by people who are working in the, in, in the more diagnostic <coughs> space as something they can just pick up and run with. Right? And so these are companies, um, a lot of the interviews that we made actually uh, with people working on. So they really think about high stakes here in this trajectory towards the use of this data in the frame. And what people have been wanting to do all along. It's also terrifying. I mean, there's very strong terms associated to this used by, by people here. Because everybody's frightened of bringing broadly research informatics and analytics to clinical space. But as long as there's only part of the decision making process, then that's probably sensible. Right. So there's a constant reiteration of people who provide this service that you know, data here are not comprehensive, they contain mistakes, they are not statistically representative in any way because they're so manually curated. This is not a result of having any uniformity in the evidence space, quite the contrary. That's why you need to have this kinds of manual curation because the, the evidence space is so disuniform and heterogeneous. You know, and they say very clear data were not representative, the true diversity of mutation in cancer. There's a bias, of course, towards mutation that get tested a lot. Um, you know, it was useful. In the end, it wasn't really transformed entirely because of this. You still have to do your due diligence. And so there still is this question of trust. Keeps going back and forth, right? We're talking about the situation in which, yeah, in some cases, we really trust this, but there's still lots of worries, even by people who are setting up this resource around why, why does that happen, on, which, on, on what is this trust um, based. So, of course, one of the things that we heard a lot from users is, again, an awareness of this tension. The fact that they need to trust the resource, and yet they know that potentially there's lots of issues here, that you know, there's only certain kinds of expertise that, that they need to have a resource like this. And so this idea of doing your own diligence became a bit of a light motive in, in talking to users here. So they talk a lot about resituating cosmic data, thinking about them from different perspectives, develop an awareness of the limitations, which means actually acquire expertise in dealing with this digital tool as much as possible, and um, think about all stages of data contextualization and how curation works. We were saying, we relied on the knowledge of people who spend a lot of time with the cancer. They had a good feel for what was real and what was not real. They knew what they knew. I did trust them that they had their finger on the pulse of the literature. Right? So the idea here is that on one end, do everything you can to recontextualize the information and to check for that. At the same time, trust the fact that there are people who basically have thought about DGs for a long time. And that's actually the cache of Cosmic. The fact that it's been around for a long time and people think this is a resource that has, if you want, priority over others because of the type of expertise and curation that, that underpins it, which is an expert curation, if you want. 
So reputation here is very, very important. You know, and, and, and people keep saying it's a hard job. A lot of people are collecting data, but Cosmic is the biggest. It's also one of the oldest. It's been around, people understand it. And interesting here is that the standardization of the curation to some extent of course is very important. That's partly what Cosmic is doing. It's partly standardizing this information in a way that it can be visualized and compared, right? <coughs> but at the same time, that standardization is not about applying this kind of one model to all genes. Quite the contrary. It's very careful thinking how do we meet, make this particular information about this particular clinical situation or this study meet the type of visualization and standard we use in so there's a lot of questions about you know, bottom-up heuristics, vocabulary, expert judgment is used all the time, and, 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 you know, and, and that we found is basically one of the things that people kept referring to. There's plenty of expertise here. The bulk of it is trustworthy. There's a few other things, I don't trust myself either, but it's uncommon. And of course, the question of cost-effectiveness here is, is imperative and, and overarching. I mean, and this is somebody who works in a small company and says, I'm not going to put somebody to reanalyze the cancer genome atlas for six months. It would take forever. It's not a good investment of time, in my opinion. So I go to Cosmic and they've done it for me. Every cancer company will be reinventing the wheel to try and filter out those common mutations. It's better than in one place with one team so that people can benefit. Very young companies, you take the go hunting fruit first, you can see it's office application, you get your pipeline set up, use it, and then yeah, maybe we'll use it for further investigation. I'm hoping that you got a sense, at least, for what this work really is about. So coming to some conclusions. Now, we think that worries that underpin the trustworthiness of cosmic, the cosmic data, are linked to uncertainty about which criteria should be used to actually judge this body of evidence at any one point. So obviously, cosmic supports understanding the genetic factors in cancer, but in what kind of mediations are needed to then extrapolate that towards clinical applications? That varies a lot depending on the kind of application you're thinking about, and that's where there's a lot of latitude for people to think differently and recontextualize this data. What is very clear from looking at this kind of work and paying attention to the nuances of it, and this is just remember, it's just a tiny little bit, just a little slight, uh, snapshot in the huge pipeline that would be going from you know, original data connection in the clinic to actually having a clinical application interpretation at the other end is that using cosmic does not in any way guarantee precision or even actual ability per se. That's something that people cannot project on the data that they find in cosmic for different reasons and in different ways depending on the research base that they in. And this is very much linked to expert specialized judgment. So it's not really about the typical mantra you hear, you know, when, when you're associated with big data and of course it's automated use in artificial intelligence, uh, digital health um, applications, quantification, statistics, repetition, they're also going to solve our problems, but actually there's very situated judgments of relevance, reliability assessments, which are very highly distributed in this system, and there is constant mindfulness of what kind of assumptions you're putting into this work in, in terms of what you think cancer biology is and how it works. And at the same time, of course, reliance on this data does involve a certain kind of reification of how we think about cancer and the role that genes play and mutations play in that. So there's this constant kind of, you know, edging there. So of course, one of the questions I started with, and I'm now going to go back to, is what kind of theory informs the interpretation of these kinds of cases? And for me, what's interesting is that we, of course, have a lot of work, which you know, other people, other people in this group are absolute experts on, about you know, the general way in which ontological views of cancer and oncology and science underpin research in this realm. But what maybe is a little bit less emphasized is the fact that there is also very particular assumptions in a case like this about how biomarkers work, what they are, what, what are we supposed to do with them in practice, and how we're supposed to contextualize that work if we do want to contextualize it. What are biological computational methods? How much do we need to know about them to be able to use them appropriately? Right? And of course, this is for me exactly an example of theoretical assumptions that enter the stage of research here at, at very different points from thinking about you know, what constitutes a knowledge of cancer in a sort of metaphysical sense. But actually end up affecting quite considerably the kind of inferences that you take out of, um, out of something like cancer. I mean, there's other, I mean, in, in, in more practical terms, I think one of, again, one of the points of Alberto Condorcio's work, which I like very much in this group, 
is the fact that they've uncovered the amount of expertise that companies that deal with very big data analysis in oncology are now having to put towards produce anything like precision medicine. So they talk about this institution that they call molecular, which is called molecular tumor boards, which is in fact a whole new set of people having to come in these kind of clinical settings and having big discussion about how exactly do we contextualize this new data so that it helps us in the clinic and with particular patients. So instead of actually simplifying and speeding up the path towards intervention, these are examples where like, the introduction of these tools is making much more complex and much more labor intensive, even if hopefully then the, the therapy that you get to may be better or may be improved by these kinds of procedures. And of course, you find you know, what, what Fortune calls forward looking judgment about all sorts of things, of course the types and the role of the mutations you find here, but also the variable treatment you're heading towards, the variable biomarkers, what kind of other data sources may be there and how may you be able to triangulate them with the defined here so that you can um, compare them, and which process should you use to actually compare these evidence. So, you know, and I think there's a question that for instance the work of Anya Kutinsky um, poses to this kind of work, um, which are very useful and interesting. I don't think I have a conclusive answer to them, but it's worth posing them. So one question is, you know, she talks about um, the fact that um, cancer research is underpinned by multimodal and cross-cutting family of classificatory schemes. And one of the questions raised by this work is, is a database like Cosmic, which is so central to this work, compatible with this or not? And again, the answer has to be a yes and no. There's a sense in which they made incredible efforts and, and, and you know, and really expertly, um, um, you know, expertise, and they've been by a lot of expertise to make it possible for Cosmic to absorb as many different types of evidence as possible uh, to think about um, the role of mutations in cancer in as, as complex a way, sophisticated as way as possible. At the same time, that is still the starting point. Is it really compatible with other ways, completely different ways of theorizing cancer? Maybe not. But the question, I think, needs to be posed probably in the practices and looking at how, you know, for instance, adopting a tissue organization field theory may fare if you then try and use some of this evidence, rather than thinking about it as just, oh, well, they did this somatic mutation, therefore, this must be completely incompatible with any other way of classifying or of thinking about cancer. And part of this is because, I mean, as Anya himself uh, points out, the ideal inference here is one that draws upon the widest array of independent evidence, where the evidence consistently points to a specific and predictable outcome, and ideally where it is at least, there is at least some plausible mechanistic description of the process yielding cancer for some proposed cause. Now, if you accept that thought about ideal inference here, well, Cosmic is certainly doing a lot to try and diversify the type of evidence you would bring to think about some of these mutations. At the same time, it's centered on that particular object, which has a potential history here. So I want to just end with a couple of words on risks and on the role of artificial intelligence applications in this realm. And I think this is, of course, a very relevant uh, thing to think about here, particularly because uh, Cosmic Unit was also worried about this. They're very aware of that there are risks. Users at the same time, which is something that Cosmic Unit was very happy with, are receiving this message and they also, you know, try to be as mindful as possible of the fact that there are limitations with this database is not, support, is not really telling you the truth in any way, something that is, a, is giving you a set of objects that need, re, still require a lot of assessment, contextualization, interpretation to be able to be used closely and to become actionable. Um, so the idea that um, you, know, you can have lots of different purposes for interpreting this data is very, very important here and becomes very clear once you start to look at the use of data across the and of course, I think the big difficult question here, which uh, Nicola is particularly interested in exploring, is well, what implication does this kind of um, consideration have for um, digital health? For the idea that actually we can go towards a world where through very clever, no doubt, uh, learning algorithms and you know, uh, or machine learning, you actually you know, speed up or at least partly automate this trajectory of inference towards, um, towards clinical intervention. And um, I have to say, this kind of work um, makes it very difficult to think about digital health actually having that kind of success. It points much more to something which I think even IBM now is coming around to, which is the idea that what we're looking at here is a very complex pipeline of information that gets rejigged and reinterpreted a lot and lots of different stages 
there's a lot of expertise and a lot of situated judgment involved at all of the stages of, of data processing. And all of that, ideally, should really be related to its final interpretation and the context of interpretation. So it's actually very difficult to produce a generalized pipeline here, or one that can be automated in a simplistic way. And that, of course, is, is very controversial, and, and you've seen it also in some of the considerations here, particularly the young companies who are just trying to, you know, we just want to produce a biomarker, just enter this super lucrative um, market by just producing the one biomarker for that one particular mutation for that particular cancer type. That's enough for us to keep afloat, that's fine, that's what we do. Right. But, but even then, even a situation where people are under a lot of financial stress um, in this hyper commercialized world of, 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 of medicine, you know, drug development, to, to produce something which is immediately actionable, even then there is this awareness that unless you contextualize this information properly, you may fail dramatically. And that's very, very important to, to what you're doing. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.